come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, welcome back to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a weekly movie review podcast that comes your way every Saturday. Hey, do us a favor. Why don't you slip on over to wherever you found us and give us a like, a star rating, a review. Hey, we'll read them later during Igor's mailbag. But all of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you. And we can become the fastest growing internet what podcast? Internet podcast? Movie review podcast yeah. in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate that no one's gone like, you know, well, technically... You're not. I the, dare someone to take the time yeah, to do that. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be flattered, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> the fastest movie review podcast in the galaxy. There you go. You heard it here. Mm-hmm. These are the internet radio superstars. Holly, Michaela. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched the movie that was chosen by you. you. That's right. All <laughs> through the end of last year of 2019, we asked you to give us a list of movies that you wanted us to uh, to watch, mm-hmm. and then we uh, had you vote for them, and then we uh, did the top four vote-getting movies. Yeah, you chose the list. You voted. Th- these are you. All you. That's right. This it's is all your number one. Your fault. I mean, thank you <laughs> very much. This has been, uh, you know, I mean, this they've been, been a lot nicer this year than in past years. I would say. I know it's strange. They went easy on us this year. Yeah, yeah. They did. We, we kind of went. Uh, I mean, I guess I don't know. You'd say they're mainstream movies. They're they're more well known, well recognized. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because yeah, mainstream is that that's a loose term for for these kind of movies because mainstream would be like my parents would know what they are. My parents would not know what this is. Well, to our audience. I know. Ma- that's mainstream, saying, yeah, like, it, within the genre. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, we have to be specific because this is not a mainstream movie. Mainstream to our listeners, yes. There you but go. But not to everybody. Everybody listening to this show has seen this movie. That's probably why they voted for it. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Tonight, we watched Creep Show from the year 1982 and directed by the George Romero. The, yes. the George Romero. How many George Romero movies have we done on this show? More than three. We had to, have, right? We did uh, Monkey Shines. Mm-hmm. We did this. Was it? There was a dead somewhere, wasn't there? Yeah, didn't we? That w- we did the Zack Snyder Dawn of the Dead. We did. Yeah, do... we did. Yeah. Uh, but I thought you guys did one like before my time. Uh, yeah, same. Uh, okay, yeah. it'll come back to me. <laughs> oh, so, I can reference the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Is he on the, right. wall? on the wall? Is the he on the wall? wall of Let's fame. Look. If you have, uh, as a filmmaker, done three. Uh, movies which we've covered on this show you get your mm-hmm. picture up on the wall of fame which is right here i'm looking at it it's behind michaela mm-hmm. and holly behind the bar in the deep dark basement That's right our deep tank basement george Romero. he's not on the wall i don't see his name but i feel like if he probably is we just don't have it documented correctly okay yeah. i like there's like an outline on the wall where like he should be you know like yeah. when you take a picture down when it's been hanging for a mm-hmm. long time there's like that kind of like outline yeah, where we did the, you just know he's going to be in that spot like the posthumous george romero i think it was monkey shines right we did uh mm-hmm. talk about george romero and his contribution to the genre mm-hmm. um this is also a movie that he made with the collaboration of stephen king uh, ironically, we just did a Stephen King. We've been movie. heavy on the King lately. <laughs> yeah, I like it though. This whole year, right? Because we did pets. Oh yeah, I was going to say we've been heavy on the King for a while now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've yeah. We did Sleepwalkers. Mm-hmm. We did um, uh, Pet the, Cemetery. Christine. The It movies. Both right, of them. both of them. Both mm-hmm. the It movies. Yeah. yeah. You were trying to figure out, is Stephen King on the wall for having appeared in three movies that right. we've done? Because he's he cameos in, in Maximum Overdrive, Sleepwalkers, Sleepwalkers. Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery. Uh-huh. Um, and if you count this movie. Wait, technically we didn't do the original Pet Cemetery. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. I did it. Yeah. Uh, like, yes, we did you're it. right. We, yeah, no, I shit, did it. We did yeah, both. we did it. Yeah. And we did, uh, he was in It Chapter 2. That's right. Okay. So he's so definitely on the wall. On the wall. Yeah. Like, And then this movie on top of that. So. so this movie comes at us from the year 1982. These two guys had uh, apparently tried to work together, uh, you know, because I think at this point in time, uh in horror right and and there was like the filmic horror you know the guy who brought you night of the living dead and then uh dawn of the dead and uh the guy who was writing all the horror books that had exploded at this point in time what was um like they were supposed to work on something else right 
It wasn't originally Creepshow. There's like a whole bunch of movies that George Romero was supposed to direct that never happened. Wasn't he attached to Pet Cemetery at one point in time? Yes, yes. But when was Pet Cemetery written? Oh, man. Was it the after book this? was like the early 80s. Yeah, but it would yeah. have been like 83 yeah. or something like that. Because, that you know, you got right. the guy who does zombie movies and the, the Stephen King story about... A zombie ch- child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that seemed like a shoe in that they developed that for years and never worked out. And then uh, he ended up doing the dark half, I think. Mm-hmm. Right. Was the uh, the Stephen King book that George Romero ended up doing. Was it? Yeah. He did the dark. I haven't half. seen that. I'm not familiar in, like, with that the one. 90s. Yeah. Really? Mm-mm. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen it. Interesting. Mm. Timothy Hutton's in it. Yeah. Mm. Um, so the genesis of this movie, what do we got? Where, where does creep show come from? It's like technically an adaptation of the EC comics, is it not? Well, it's not an adaptation because these stories were created specifically by Stephen King. But the concept. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The concept is very much Tales from the Crypt and EC comics. Right. Uh, I don't know how much we should go into that because um, we did a tales. We did the Tales from the Crypt movie that was made in 1972. Mm-hmm. If you go back, there is a Saturday Night Freak Show episode cool. where we talked about it. But basically, EC Comics, for those of you who don't know, uh, started out being educational comics, like in the 30s or 40s. And I believe it was William Gaines and Al Feldstein. Uh, two guys took it over and they turned it into entertainment comics. But then it became the uh, Tales from the Crypt, uh, the Vault of Horror, uh, the Haunt of Fear, and crime suspense stories and all this other stuff. And uh, they were horror comics. But they only lasted for a period of, I think, like five years or so because there was a guy named Frederick Wortham who wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent who said that basically all juvenile delinquency could be traced back to comics now this mm-hmm. actually it's a wild went, book yeah it's wild <laughs> Have you, do you know I've read parts of it yeah, I had so what are school. like some of his claims i mean it's very similar to like the satanic panic of the 80s right it's all that same kind of like language that, like this is like a gateway to like really fuck up your kids kind of propaganda yeah mm-hmm. yeah because he made uh claims like he said there was homosexuality in batman and robin's relationship uh wonder woman was like uh bondage uh, lesbian there was like all these like you know coded things that he believed were in all these comics everybody took this like seriously at the time and then uh there was a like a, a house judiciary committee on juvenile delinquency and they brought uh william gaines uh before like the u.s government i mean they, he had to defend his comedy he was just like okay fine fuck it and he gave it up <laughs> right so that would have been like the 50s, okay? And they 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 made the movie in 72, which was a British movie by Amicus uh, Films, which it adapts several stories from Tales from the Crypt, but it doesn't really feel Tales from the Crypty. But this movie... <laughs> feels very crypty. <laughs> feels like it. Uh, it feels like those comics. Yeah. So much so that they actually recruited... Um, what was the artist? Uh, Jack Kamen, I believe, was one of the artists from Tales from the Crypt, like, came in to do all the um, all the transitions the transitionals, yeah. that are done in this movie. Which because, are great. How would you yeah. describe, like, what are, what are we talking about? It's like, yeah, I mean, it's comic animation overlaid with the live action footage a lot yeah. of the times. And, like, really bold, like, reds and blues and harsh lines and stuff. Primary it's awesome. colors yeah. and... Yeah. Yeah, but every every like uh, uh, the the stories there's five jolting tales of terror, mm-hmm. right? That are uh, it's so it's an anthology creep show. Mm-hmm. Um, that the the style of the movie. This is the first time I ever saw this done, and I've seen it done since. Have you ever seen the new version of the Warriors? Uh, mm-hmm. Does it? Uh, the Ang Lee Hulk does it but they try to replicate they, like they what? did it in colin's favorite movie my boyfriend's back yeah they oh, did, did they? yeah they did even... he blocked it yeah <laughs> blocked that, it, it was really well done in that it's movie. very yeah. well done in that movie yeah but a, like a a frame a scene will freeze frame on something it'll turn into a comic book yeah. and we'll you'll actually see like as if you're scanning to another panel and then that's an animation and then that comes to life or whatever mm-hmm. this one does a lot of like kind of crazy um more so than any of those other movies with like uh the like frames. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the comic panel frames yeah. are around the scene a lot of the scenes. But some of them are really inventive. Mm-hmm. I mean like uh you know the cake 
uh, like the the drawing the the whatever. What am I trying to the say? Icing like the, like the piping the cake. Yeah, the yeah. piping around yeah. the cake becomes like that's an the animated border. like yeah. a circular you know a cutout in the in the picture you're watching, mm-hmm. or he'll do um like a split screen where one character will be talking on one side. I'm thinking of the conversation between was it Fritz Weaver and the uh, the janitor where. You know, guys on one side talking on the phone, and then he freeze frames, and then we see Fritz or Fritz Weaver on the other side, like he starts talking, you know, stuff like that. So it's a very stylish movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that never gets mentioned, right? We know that George Romero worked on Dawn of the Dead mm-hmm. with Dario Argento, who produced Dawn of the Dead. So he was aware of Dario Argento. He was friends with Dario Argento, mm-hmm. right? The lighting in this. I was going to say the lighting. Yeah. I knew where you're going with that. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. red or blue, sometimes yeah. both. <laughs> right. Yeah, or a little bit of like green or yellow somewhere in the background or Those whatever. Are primary colors. Mm-hmm. But Gotta that's love it. clearly, you know, it's like to me, I, I hadn't seen anything done like that outside of uh, like Suspiria or Inferno at that point, mm-hmm. and I have to assume that you know seeing Argento do that kind of gave Romero the license to go like, you know, that's pretty. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's a thing I can do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, you know, it adds to this. um, How would you describe? I mean, okay. So it's a, it's a, it's creep show, right? It's going to be like this scary, horrifying, ter- you know, the two Titans Mm -hmm. of terror coming together. But is that the tone you get out of this movie? No, no, it's, it's, it definitely has more of like a, like a TV show quality. I don't mean that as like a slam, but just like, yeah, it feels like tales from the crypt or like, are you afraid of the dark or something mm-hmm. like that? And I, I don't really know why, like what the difference is, you know, but, and like, obviously as the comic book style too, but something about the production. Yeah. yeah. It's you know? a, Cause it's, it's cartoony. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it, it's the theme carries into the show. It's not just the comic transitions. Like the whole thing does feel like a comic that's come to life. Mm-hmm. Mm. You it know feels like I mean? there could be commercial breaks really easy yeah. in this, you know. But it doesn't take itself seriously, maybe. It's, it's, right, it's a sense of humor that I think, I think the first time that I saw this, I thought it was yeah. going to be darker or scarier. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This was not what I expected the first time I saw this right. movie. And to be honest, I mean, I saw this, I remember this poster in a theater lobby, uh, you know, when I was a kid. And I remember seeing the trailer on the front of something. I think it was maybe like Empire Strikes Back. It might have had been a trailer awesome. for Creep Show. And I remember going like, you know, what? There's guys crawling out of the ground. Yeah. You know, and there's uh, waterlogged zombies and you know monsters and whatever the hell. And uh, yeah, so this has been with me for a very long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> um. But I guess I wasn't expecting it to be as uh, tongue in cheek. Yeah, I was, like, was going to just say it's cheeky. Yeah, it's, it's a cheeky movie. And it doesn't feel like it's going for like a hard R rating or anything. No. either. And like, I don't want to. It doesn't feel censored, but it also doesn't feel made for kids either. It's this. It's a I weird in between. This, yeah, I know. Because I, at one point I was like, this almost feels like like kid like kids centered but it's not it's not juvenile uh, yeah yeah i get what yeah. you're saying it's, it's very yeah, yeah. See, to me it feels very juvenile but i mean maybe it's a is it just because it's not super gory like if it was gorier would it feel more adult i don't know i mean it feels uh, i guess what it see i don't know if this is uh, if i'm just throwing in what i know of you know like the idea that it's 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 an you got an adult guy stephen king right and george romero who grew up i'm assuming in the 50s and were fans of these comics right it's actually it's kind of strange that they didn't go and just buy the rights to the you know somehow right. it was cheaper just to like well, we'll come up with our own thing that's an homage but it's adult guys looking back on you mm-hmm. know the comics that they read voraciously when they were kids yeah. you know mm-hmm. um and trying to do a version of it. So it's like, it is made for adults. I mean, there's swearing and there's adult situations right. and stuff like that. And there's gore, but the whole idea of them, you know, it's like somebody turns into a weed or, you know, there's a monster in a crate and there, you know, all this stuff is very juvenile. And so it's like, it's, it's like, it's intended for the child in all of us. Yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But it's also watching it tonight. I'm like, 
like this brand of horror is like what I think uh, maybe because I saw stuff like this or, you know, those anthology um, Mm -hmm. horror show, you know, movies or whatever of the, of the seventies. This is like what, to me, it's like, Oh, this is what horror actually is. (laughs) You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, this is what horror is. Creepy dudes crawling out of, you know, the water and, you know, monsters and boxes and Mm -hmm. creepy cockroaches eating people yeah <laughs> you know? i know i was thinking that this whole time like there was there were moments where it, it slows down a little bit but ultimately like the things that are happening are truly horrific mm-hmm. like the you know being buried alive in sand and, I, I'm and not gonna, <sighs> like that i was getting anxious because we i don't think we've said this is my first time watching this we haven't told our <laughs> yeah, right. that. Is, yeah. <laughs> I haven't shared that yet. This is my first time watching this. I realize I'm very late to the party. It's one of those things where you're just like, it's always in the back of your head, like, oh, I'll get to it. Mm-hmm. I'll get to it. And I just never did. But anyway, there's like truly horrific things like being buried alive in sand and drow- and the the impending drowning and then it being like killed by the, oh, the bug, Scud. It was really horrific. Mm-hmm. Like, truly. But that's, I think, Stephen King's, I don't know, is his, his genius. You know, it's yeah. that he was able to determine, I mean, because you figure, what, he read how many issues of of, of Tales from the mm-hmm. Crypt and Haunt of yeah. Fear and all that there were, and he kind of distilled what types of tales were told and then hooked them with, like, some kind of morbid anxiety, mm-hmm. you know? The idea there, of having, uh, you know, uh, something growing on you, the uh, uh, or bugs, or you know, being buried up to your neck and yeah. not being able to do anything, or something underneath the stairs, mm-hmm. you know, in the basement, you know, they're all really simple concepts. Mm-hmm. They are you know. universal. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, the movie starts out. It stars uh, Tom. Oh, there's like a, the cast it's, in this movie. The cast is fucking awesome. Yeah, it's it surprising. really is. It really is. This is what, you know, watching it tonight, I'm like, this does not feel like a George Romero movie, did it? No. No, I actually, not at all. I was going to say after watching this, I think this might be like one of his most best directed things ever in his career. And I think I think that because it doesn't feel like his other stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially when yeah. you compare, well, I assume Dawn of the Dead must have been, that was 78, right? That had to have been the last thing he did. Knight Riders. Oh, Stephen King is in Knight Riders briefly. Uh, but I think that was before. Is that before Dawn of the Dead? I think it was. And I mean, he'd done a bunch of stuff after Night of the Living Dead, you yeah. know, Martin and Season of the Witch and uh, the Crazies and, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this doesn't feel like anything that no, he has it doesn't. done even since, you know? I, lo- I like it. I like that he's doing <laughs> yeah. something different, you know? Yeah. Like, especially we've watched a lot of like Toby Hooper lately, it seems like, and like he does, yeah, he does different things, but they're not necessarily successful, you know, mm-hmm. whereas I think Romero, this is different and successful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was like a huge hit, I guess. It was in, uh... his only movie to open at number one. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's crazy. Well, yeah. This was the moment when they were both, you know, this is the guy who made Dawn of the Dead and the guy who's made, you know, The Shining, mm-hmm. and, which it came out like what? Like uh, two the- years before this two years Three, before this, two years before this yeah. and Stephen King was just about to explode I mm-hmm. mean he was already huge in the literary world but you know yeah well we had Carrie and Christine at this point too right and Salem's Lot yep. had been on TV mm-hmm. and uh was uh Cujo after this I think, I think but so, you know yeah. I mean there was you know mm-hmm. and uh um Christine was just around the corner yeah I mean it was uh that time, you know, mm-hmm. to have these two guys come together. Well, I guess it says it's the masters of terror and the macabre, you know, George mm-hmm. Romero and Stephen King together. And that's a great poster. It's one of the greatest posters I think I've ever seen in it's my amazing. life. Uh, the ticket taker being mm-hmm. the creep. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> We're going to call him the creep, right? Okay. Yeah. Works for me. I don't yeah. know if that's, uh, he actually does show up in the movie. Mm-hmm. The skeleton uh, guy all wrapped up in, you know, decaying clothing. In the prologue, mm-hmm. uh, this movie yeah. is tied together by a prologue that stars uh, the great Tom Atkins. Sans mustache again. again. <laughs> this is guys, we're getting re- <laughs> like this is getting a little too close together. Of like, <laughs> Tom Atkins is on the wall, right? With uh, yeah, the fog, drive angry, and yeah, okay, then, yeah, and I, he was absolutely on the creeps, wall. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I really loved about this this prologue. <laughs> And the moment the the little boy looks up in the window and sees the creep and they're like, he's like smiling at him and then the creep smiles back at him. 
like I said, this was my first time watching it, but just seeing that, I was like, that tells me everything I'm about to see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it really did. It really sets I was like, the I know stage. exactly what I'm about to I, watch. It's kind of, it's like a morbid, is it morbid? It's, um, how would you describe that? Like, I mean, it's, you know, basically there's a kid who's, his dad is taking the position probably of the parents who believe in the, the, the whole comics cause juvenile delinquency mm-hmm. thing. Tom Atkins is, you know, like, I'm not having any of this horror crap. And like uh, bitch slaps the kid. Yeah. Do you yeah. know do you know who that little kid was? Who was it? It's Joe Hill, Stephen King's son. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> That's funny. Now he's a, he's the creator of Lock and Key and a bunch yeah. of uh, he, horror novels himself. Didn't him and Stephen King do uh in the tall grass together or something mm-hmm. like that? Yeah. Yeah, heart shaped box good. and horns, yeah. Um the um but the, the so the first story. Are we going to go through all these stories? Yeah. Is that what you want to do? Yeah, yeah hell Let's yeah! Do it. I think okay. I think when we do our wrap up too, we should all rank the the stories. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Well, the first story they were actually out of uh, order from the way that they were supposed to go. I think the really? third and the fourth. Because if you read the uh, there's a um, it's like an oversized book that came out at the same time as a comic book, and they got Bernie Wrightston, mm-hmm. you know who he, who he is, the uh, artist. To do, he did like a bunch of swamp thing and all this stuff. Oh, cool. okay. uh, that cool. Frankenstein illustrated Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, but he did the art for it, and it's the creep show. You know, it's the adaptation, the the adaptation of it, the comic mm-hmm. adaptation. But I believe the fourth story was supposed to be uh, something that tied you over. The creep was ac- or, uh, the crate was actually the middle story, oh, and they okay. flipped it around. And I'm like, does it play better this way? Because you kind of lead up to the because that's the scary mm. one. Mm, I don't know. I no? felt. I, I mean, my personal opinion is that the first three are super strong, and then after that, it really drops off. Oh, okay. I find the first two to seem to be wa- wandering and padding for time, or the last two to be wandering and padding for time. Oh, interesting. Okay, because they I felt it was longer. Like, it felt. I thought it was they were trying to. You know, the first ones are like. There's less humor in the last two, mm-hmm. yeah. maybe. Mm-hmm. They're like the first ones are kind of like, yeah, it's mm-hmm. scary, but we're gonna, you know, give you humor to offset it. And the last two are like, okay, now we're settling in for like the scary stuff. But I don't even know if that, you know, that they're all still funny regardless. But I wonder if that's why they made that change. The first story is called Father's Day, right? Oh. And I, it, I was sitting here trying to remember what the first one was. <laughs> it stars a very young Ed Harris uh, yeah. in, a, uh, in a, a supporting part. Um, so this one. Uh, was some sick dance with I was <laughs> right. Random like he was dancing. breaking a sweat. Oh, yeah. Because he's all uh, duck, duck going or whatever. It's disco, disco, duck. disco ducking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wish that's what the song would have been. I know, right? That would have been amazing. <laughs> the. Um, but the idea is that uh, there's this woman named Bedelia, and uh, she murdered her father, who was a tycoon, Robert Baron, something bootlegger, mm-hmm. right? Many years ago, because he was like, "I want my cake," and uh, You're goddamn right, he did. That's yeah. his. He just know, wanted his cake personally. Well, he was an evil old bastard, right? Was he? Just give the man his cake. This is a rich family, right? Ed Harris is the uh, like the guy who's just married into the right. the the wealthy uh, group. Yeah, and uh, they seem to kind of cast him as like uh, an outsider, kind of. Mm-hmm. They're like yeah. they're welcoming like him she, in, but they're also yeah, like she married beneath her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is not Bedelia, but Bedelia's granddaughter or niece? whoever niece. Yeah, niece. great yeah. niece. It's a lot of rich people standing around just like casually throwing insults at each other. Oh, yeah. For a long time. For a lot of it. That's that's one thing. Like the, the common theme in all of these um, in all, all of these pieces is that everyone's an asshole. Yeah. Every person in all of these is just the worst. The eventual victims, you're saying. The, the, what are the um, uh, all the, the characters? Everyone. Pretty much. So Ted Danson and his girlfriend, but they. I mean, the morally, they, they maybe not great, but they cheated. I suppose on the Leslie Nielsen character. I mean, they don't. They, I mean, yeah, we don't get into like their character all that much, but they kind of seem like they're rich assholes too. I don't know. What about Jordy Verrill? Mm, he's just kind of pathetic. Okay. Yeah. A little bit. Okay. Because I'm, I'm working, I'm trying to work on this, you know, myself. It's like, are these, yeah. 
you know, the idea, I suppose, of Tales from the Crypt is that they're, they're, they were morality tales, you know? Hmm. The uh, common wisdom, I think, is that basically, like, you know, the guys who made them were Jewish kids who, after, you know, World War II, you know, were basically confronted with the idea that, you know, it's like the guy in the cape doesn't come down and rescue you. The, right. you know, it's like horrible things do happen and the mm-hmm. world kind of sucks. And so they said, well, we're in horror, though, uh, you know. After you, uh, you know, the, the the two scheming lovers, you know, put the husband in, uh, you know, the cement, uh, whatever, on his feet and drop him in the river and they get away with it. Mm-hmm. And then the fucking, you know, guy clauses with the supernatural basically mm-hmm. like comes back to level the playing field. Mm-hmm. So it's like somehow morality will set the balance right. You know, mm-hmm. uh, is that what's happening here? Well, especially well, in Father's Day, I think that it is right. It's more like a revenge thing. I don't know if it's balancing, yeah. but it's well, she a revenge killed, She story. killed the guy, right? Yeah, and he killed way more people. <laughs> so yeah, it's not exactly maybe. balanced. Yeah. <laughs> so he was a bad guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. Like Holly said, everyone's a everyone's bad Everyone's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and we looped right back around to your point. <laughs> yeah. So he comes back from the dead, which is uh, 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 kind of cool. Or It's awesome. It's a maggot suit. Yeah. It's pretty dope. The special effects in this are by um, Tom Savini. Mm -hmm. I was going to say it's probably Tom Savini, (laughs) I'd assume. Which he's got to be like on our freak show wall of fame, right? He has been for a very long uh, time. Texas Chainsaw 2 and... uh, Sleepwalkers. He's in that for a second. Yeah, he has a cameo in that scene where they all have the cameo at the ambulance. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. It's like him, John Landis, Toby Hooper, Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Oh, I forgot to tell oh, yeah. you. Uh, wasn't he in, um, was it Intruder? Yes. He was in that too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's done makeup effects on The mm-hmm. Burning and you know several other movies that we did. Yeah. Um, and he's in this, mm-hmm. The Garbage Man. Um, so Savini's doing the effects work. Uh, and one of them, actually, I think it, Savini do a lot of monsters. Yeah, I think so. I know did that he? they said that he consulted with Rob Bottin on. Um, I think the crate for that, some of that stuff, like, yeah. cause he, had, like, you know, he doesn't Fluffy. really, he doesn't really do a ton of animatronic stuff. Mm-hmm. So like they said, he consulted with Rob Botin for stuff on this movie. Did, did that feel, was that animatronic or I suppose I like some of the. They said animatronics in this movie. I don't know I what specifically like, that means. But I felt like the close up of the face was animatronic and then there was also a bodysuit. Like yeah. the wide shots for the yeah, bodysuit? Yeah, yeah. That's what it seemed like to me, because it was very like mechanical when they had the close-ups of the face. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe the creep was animatronic, because it didn't look like there was a guy in that suit. Yeah, there, that could be too, yeah. I was kind of bummed that like we didn't get to see more of him, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I was kind of hoping he'd loop back. Well, he yeah. turns into a cartoon at some point. Yeah, right? which was cool. Which was very cool, but I was kind of hoping we'd loop back to him. Yeah. 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 In uh, Creep Show 2, mm-hmm. uh, Tom Savini plays a character called the Creep. I believe that one takes place in a movie theater, the wraparound. Cool. Have you seen it? No, I want to, though. Yeah, cool. I think he plays the creep, but it, I mean, he looks different. He's got a big chin, you know, right. mm-hmm. uh, augmented forehead and, you know, the whatever brow. Um, but uh, have you seen the new uh, creep show TV show that's on Shudder? No, because everyone has said it's terrible. It's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. It's pretty so I've bad. heard from everyone. But I don't get like the love for that thing. Everybody's like, it's awesome. And they're bringing it back for a season two. And I'm, the fact that Creep Show is still a deal, like in 2019, is kind of uh, cool. Right? Honestly, on paper, it sounds awesome. You yeah. know, like a Creep Show TV show now. Yeah, uh, especially, it's like what? Shutter or HBO or something, right? It's, it's Shutter, yeah. So it's well, their like, main, like, apparently, uh, they released their streaming numbers. That's the number one thing that they have. I was going to say, so network. basically, what it is is everyone's like oh this sucks but they're not listening to that they're just like oh ratings everyone watched it so we're bringing it back mm-hmm. yeah yeah and that's it's creep what that show is. because yeah. it's the name mm-hmm. which they have a creep in there because it's greg nicotero now is uh is handling all that stuff so there is a creep character mm-hmm. that kind of introduces all the segments but even though it's animatronic it doesn't talk or do anything that that's sucks. lame what's the yeah, point yeah it's kind of like i don't know that was my problem with it. I'm like, do you're, something. Yeah. If you're used to the Crypt Keeper, because I mean that was the thing we had after. Oh yeah. Creep show was Classic, the yeah. Tales from the Crypt yeah. television show. Uh, you got to try and at least you know uh, take him on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so in Father's Day, I mean mm-hmm. we've got a morality tale. Then I guess or something. Or I'm saying that maybe it's not. It's, it's the a revenge. Ori- it's the original, ready or not. <laughs> 
<laughs> I did think that about the house. <laughs> well, and like a rich family that has like this, I don't know, if, I don't know if you could call it a curse in this movie, but like their actions come back to bite them in the ass and kill all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Did it and feel a big like, rich mansion. Yeah. Well, but they set that up, I think, in the dialogue because uh, Sylvia, right? The uh, Bedelia's sister, mm-hmm. Bedelia's niece. I don't but- know. Uh, I, think she, it's, I think it's Bedelia's sister. Maybe. She helped because she says something about Aunt Bedelia, but I don't know if it's her aunt. I think or she's it saying, your, I think she's like your aunt. So she calls her Aunt Bedelia. Okay. Like, you know, because it's her dad, right? I'm not positive. I think it is. But it sounds like Bedelia killed her dad and Sylvia helped clean it up. And so there was no trouble with the will. And so the kids are. Uh, living off of uh, the, the inheritance, the inheritance, mm-hmm. which is ill-gotten. Sure. And so by the you know rationale of how these supernatural things go, that's why they're all marked for death sure. and can die. Yeah. The first segment also introduces, and we can't forget this, the ashtray, the yes. uh, murder weapon, which then shows up in all of the subsequent tales. Gotcha. Yeah. And I kept forgetting to look for it every time. Yeah. It's like when, and I'd be like, oh shit, I didn't make note of where it was. <laughs> There's a couple of I was just oh, so wrapped is. up in the movie, I didn't even think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did we think of the first episode? What I liked it a lot. I liked it. That was a really solid intro. That was a good one. Did you get your zombies? You got people coming back from the dead? Oh, yeah. Decapitation. Yeah. Yeah. Get a, a little head bit cake. Of- <laughs> he got his cake, yeah, man. He cake. got his cake. That's he can great. have his cake and eat it too. Yeah. Mm. I still say if Bedelia had just taken the cake to his grave, none of this would have happened. Yeah. Instead, she just went to harass a dead man's yeah. grave. Like, I was like, leave, leave a cake at his grave. He'd probably leave you alone. Yeah. He was probably also pissed she spilled all that Jim Beam in the dirt, right? Too. So, how come she didn't come back like any of the previous years? I don't get it. Or he didn't come back. This happens every year. Right. Does she go and yell at him every year like that? I yeah, assume, yeah. yeah said, okay. That's what she said. She said, "Huh?" But they were gonna have know. they were gonna have dinner, and she's like, "But before she comes in, she's gonna go to fa- to father's grave and meditate." Is what she yeah. said. <laughs> For about Interesting. An hour. Then she'll come in, and we'll have a nice ham. ham. <laughs> nice. Oh yeah, that's nice right. The ham. ham with Mrs. Danvers. Oh, if you have a maid, it has to be Mrs. Danvers, Obviously. right? Is that uh, Rebecca or whatever. Um. So the second story mm-hmm. then is uh, The Lonesome Death of Jordy uh, Barrel. Yeah. Sounds like a Western. It does. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah, because... It I'm, sounds like part... Um, um, it'd be a segment in Buster Scruggs. Yeah, it does. Right? <laughs> yeah. The Lonesome Death of Jordy Barrel. Yeah, it does, it actually. Does. Well, that's an anthology movie. Yeah, it is. Oh, let's had, make like, them do something good... like this. Right? Like, let's give them a horror <gasps> anthology and oh, make the Coen Brothers God, do it. I would love that so much. Dope. There is a horror Western uh, anthology is it Grim Prairie Tales? What? What? Grim yeah. Prairie that, I Tales? Ha- I Grim hate Prairie. that. <laughs> it's, oh uh, yeah, it's got James Earl Jones and Shut Brad Dorif are sitting around a campfire telling, I can't remember who's Shut telling the story. Up. Yeah. Is, yeah. It, is this it, honestly sounds like something only the Coens could pull off. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't think this one was pulled off very well. I was but gonna yeah. say, was it amazing? And you're just never it's told like us about from it. From like ninety two or ninety three. Yeah, that's like not that. a great that's time for something like that. Yeah. Directed video, Grim Oof, Prairie Tales. Yeah. You have to look it up. No, but it's a horror western anthology. But like. The Coens doing uh, any sort of like horror anthology, I think, would be well because awesome. in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, mm-hmm. the last story basically does kind of wander into that. They had a story that gave me a straight up like anxiety attack watch uh, watching it. Which like one? the the one with the woman on the prairie. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. well, that, that one. That I was like, like one of the great yeah. Western yeah. stories. Of, yeah. <laughs> Dude. That's pretty good. Um, that was in my top five that year. Yeah, that same. Was a great yeah. movie. Yeah. Uh, so, Lonesome Death of Jordy yeah, Verrill yeah. has uh, it does actually star Stephen King. Who knew the guy was going to be an actor? He probably didn't even know. Is he an actor? <laughs> I mean, are you an actor if you write something and then decide to be in right? it? Right. Like- <laughs> Well, they, at some point, uh, you know, Romero has to be like, Steve, why don't you play that? I mean, that that's kind of fucked up, though. The fact that you're a writer, but you know this guy who makes movies, and now you're one step away from being a movie star. Well, I mean, and especially in an anthology, like, 
it's really easy to just be like, yeah, sure, you can have this one story, you know, because that's yeah. the lead of the whole movie. Because right. you know? if you fuck it up, it doesn't matter. Right. There's four more stories to carry this, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah. So this is kind of a, uh, it's a, a nod to the H.P. Lovecraft story, The Color Out of Space, right? Mm-hmm. A, a meteor falls on a farm mm-hmm. and uh, immediately shit goes bad. Um, it starts growing things everywhere. Sure. Uh, but what the the tone of this one is it different than the rest of the movie or is it still you think it's, it's keeping- a little it's a little slapstick it <laughs> well, this was a big discussion among us but it feels <laughs> like it's a different time I, out we of couldn't a different figure time out entirely. what time yeah we could not figure out what time period this was because it was very like the phone was from like 1890 and the TV was like the well, first the TV, but then the show they were watching, they were watching wrestling and it was, or he was watching wrestling. It was clearly from the seventies. It was yeah. really weird. And we were all very caught up in that. Yeah. And he was, ha- <laughs> he was having like these, these visions like, oh, if I went to the doctor, this is how it'd go. And they the clothes they were wearing were like straight out of the forties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was very bizarre. Very yeah. bizarre. It's a very old timey kind of thing but uh, the 70s but Stephen King was the plays wild this <laughs> right that's what we're thinking he was watching WWF right yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, Stephen King plays this character very broad very broad you can see all of his eyeballs all the time oh yeah, yeah. he's playing it very like cross-eyed hillbilly farmer and it's it, like I said it's very slapsticky it's very, even, the, it, even if it's just him it's very slapsticky and it's trying to be a live action cartoon it's what it kind of seems feels like, like yeah. That, yeah. I mean, his exaggerated everything emotions and expressions and all that are all yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's basically two actors in this entire thing. I don't know who the other guy was. I'm sorry, but he plays the Jordy's father. He plays the doctor. Yeah. In the the dream scene, he plays mm-hmm. the guy at the college. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's basically a two hander. But basically, what happens is Jordy goes out, touches the meteor which he should never do because he gets meteor shit all over his hand. <laughs> Love it. And uh, it's so cartoony. Yeah. Like it feels like this could be Bugs Bunny or Jerry from T- or, or Tom from Tom and Jerry. It's and it would be goo. the exact same. Like, yeah. Purple it, goo comes out of the middle of the meteor. Yeah. And yeah. he pours it in a hole. Yeah. yeah. That's what happens. Like that's, that's, that's the story. All over the, and then <laughs> everything starts growing. And then he eventually starts growing and he turns into a weed. I was laughing my ass off when, at the end of this story. <laughs> <laughs> and he shoots himself in the head when he's a moss man, basically. Yeah. I was like, this is uh, this is amazing. Like, and it worked, though. Apparently, even if you're like almost entirely moss, you can still blow your own brains out. Yeah, as long as you can get your moss-encrusted finger into the, <laughs> the mean, trigger that, guard. Does that mean like he's still part person yeah, under that it moss just, Is it just growing on top of him? Yeah. Or is it like, has he become moss? I assume that he's become moss, because I assume it grows on the inside, too. Then it's not just on the external, that <laughs> right? It's got to be growing in your lungs and shit. But he's there was like some matter. Species. When he shot himself in the head, there was like goo and yeah. like brain matter, it looked like, or yeah, something. Yeah, but it wasn't like human brain So tissue. it was like he was becoming a weed, but he wasn't totally there yet. He yeah. was a, a conscious weed. He could have been like Swamp Thing, <laughs> but no, he had to I kill was, himself. I, so I've seen this movie before, but I like barely remembered it, some of these segments. But I was hoping that they would Is cut- Is this your second time through? Third, I think. Third, okay. But, well, okay, the second time I watched it, I was at a drive-in and I was really drunk. And this was like the second to last movie in like a four movie show all nighter. So yeah, that's just a bad I idea. was in and out of consciousness. No anthologies <laughs> at the drive-in. Unless that's the only thing you're showing. Right. That's Then that's it. But actually- you know, I don't even know if that's a good idea because there's so much getting up and moving around and going and like, you know, not really sitting still to drive in. It's so easy to miss something. And mm-hmm. like if you miss something in an anthology, like the story's just over then, you yeah. know. So maybe you're onto something here, Colin. Well, yeah. yeah, but you can't have like, you know, whatever, two full length films where you start with a bunch of people. And right. Go to the end. And then you have to, you know, because an anthology does that in this one five times. Right. You know, you have yeah. to start over yeah. every 20 minutes or whatever. But I was hoping that they were going to cut to a close up of his hand reaching for the trigger. And then like his hand would have just turned to complete moss before he could pull the trigger. And then he'd be like, no, he yeah. can't even kill himself now. Like yeah, I was hoping yeah, yeah. that was going to happen. I did like the very end where it was, uh, you see all these kind of uh, nice uh, panoramic shots of, you know, the the green shit. It's, it's growing everywhere. Oh, 
it go. looks very innocuous. It just looks like weeds or like yeah. moss. It yeah, doesn't yeah. look scary. Where you see the, the street signs, Boston this way, Castle Rock that way. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that was pretty, yeah. Yeah. pretty slick. <laughs> and the weather guy is like, uh, we're looking at like, you know, we're going to get a lot of rain. It's, it's going to turn green really fast. You know, like, <laughs> pretty great. Yeah. Uh, third story then, you know, is uh, the something that tied you over. Yeah. Not going to lie. This one kind of fucked me up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. This one was, Tell effe- me how. This one was effective. It got, it like, I think it got so favorite. serious. Yeah. Compared to the previous two. And it was like some serial killer shit. Yeah. Like, yeah. like I would like. That's it's so out of step in a good way with the rest of like the vibes it of the other stories. It switches gears, man. Yeah. It really does. This From seems like it could have been like a Netflix to, show. Now we're going all of a sudden. This is more serious, mm-hmm. and especially next to like the slapstick Stephen King. All of a sudden, it's like one eighty, like yeah. totally different. Mm-hmm. This feels like uh, like if this was like a feature length, it feels like something David Fincher would direct, and you'd be like, that was so dark, but. It was awesome, you know. Yeah, like, he's doing his own uh, anthology now too, right? That mm-hmm. Love and Robots for Netflix. That sounds uh, like now what I want David okay. Fincher to be doing with his time. <laughs> Make a fucking movie again, dude. Yeah, well, he's not doing My Hunter anymore. Nope, no. they, put, <clears throat> they put that on hold for oof, oof, permanent hold. I know. Um, I'm not happy about it. But this one stars a very young Ted Danson. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pre Cheers, right? Right on the right cusp. Here. Yeah, the right cusp there. Cheers. Mm-hmm. Um, and Leslie Nielsen. Yes. Who everybody now, of course, thinks of ne- Leslie Nielsen as a comedy. Naked, naked mm-hmm. Gun. Yeah, yeah, come on. Which that was based on a TV show that he did. You know mm-hmm. this? Mm-mm. Police Squad. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Which came before the Naked Gun movies. But Leslie Nielsen, like, was in uh, Forbidden Planet, you know, in the, the 50s. I mean, he was a dramatic actor until. Yeah. yeah. Airplane, Airplane, yeah. I think mm-hmm. was the one that introduced him to the Zucker brothers. And then, yeah. But I think I heard, you know, like anecdotes, like even on the set of Creep Show, uh, he would blow people's takes by having like a fart uh, machine in his pocket or something. <laughs> and so it would be like action. And he'd, you know, say his line and then fart and Ted dance and bust up laughing. What a professional. Yeah. So he's always had that in him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's crazy the knowing that they were able to make this as serious as it was then, you know. Yeah, if he's yeah, not yeah. taking it seriously, it's kind of amazing they were able to. But I believe pull this him. Up. You know, they. <laughs> yeah, I thought he did a great job. No, yeah, I think yeah. so too. But man, the editing around those farts really sold it. <laughs> yeah, well, this seems like a, a, a this seems like a quintessential to me. This maybe it feels like the type of Tales from the Crypt story maybe that I gravitated to. It always does seems like there's a, lo- a love triangle mm-hmm. somehow. And either it's, you know, the two people trying to get one over on the husband to get away from the husband or whatever. Or this one, it's the husband who catches his wife and uh, or his cheating wife and her lover. And he decides he's going to torture them to death by having them bury themselves up to their necks in the, in the sand in the, in the t- above or below the high tide line. And the the tide's gonna come in yes. as long as you can hold your breath. A and slow ass drowning with yeah. some waterboarding before that. <laughs> yeah, and he sets up cameras and a TV so they can. I don't know if she can see him, but Ted Dan can. Ted Danson can see her as she's dying. Oh, yeah, this is next level it's shit. Fucked up. Yeah, like that's the serial killer shit because like yeah. to do to have the technology to do that in 1982. That's commitment. Like, right? well, that's why, he, yeah, because he has to go back in his Jeep and bring down the like, cable. The yeah. Cable yeah. On spools. It's like, that's whoa, a committed whoa. serial killer, though, man. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, he's great in it. Mm-hmm. I think they're both great because, mm-hmm. like, Ted Dance and I believe him, you know? Yeah. He's yeah. Like, you know, you feel how fast your heart's beating, Harry? That's going to make it harder to hold your breath. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. So fucked up. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. The music in this one, I think this is my favorite piece of the score maybe outside of like the main title Mm -hmm. uh this music here this is john harrison did the music to this Mm -hmm. movie um it's all synth stuff so this is that stuff again that like john carpenter and you know this is 80s synth uh music that they're doing um they use this again in um the thanksgiving trailer from uh grindhouse the eli roth uh, thanksgiving uses this piece of music cool 
Uh, Harrison, he went on to be a director himself. He directed Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. Nice. And uh, we'll all remember him for uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. And oh, was it yeah. Children of Dune or whatever came after that? You know what's you know what's frustrating about that? Mm. I'm I'm kind of being sold on this new Dune movie or Are two you? or two movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drinking the Kool Aid. <laughs> The cast list, man. Yeah, the cast it goes and the, on for the days. cast list like, and the director. Like yeah, I Dylan haven't is. seen anything he's done that I didn't like. Yeah. I've liked every movie yeah, yeah. I've ever watched of his. That's right. So. I'm a fan of Blade Runner 2049. Well, if he I don't can, care if what he they can say. make me like Dune, then yeah, he's a fucking god. <laughs> I, well, that, I kind you. of that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, if he makes Dune and I still don't like it, then it's just never gonna yeah. be. Yeah, for yeah me. it's never if gonna anyone be there. can make me like it. It's him. Yeah, that's true. I'll so, give you that. I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic. My bar is very low, but all of his movies are so good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, except maybe, was it Enemy? I didn't like that. Well, anyway, sorry. Detour. Uh, the, uh, so that one ends with uh, the, the you know, they the, the husband. Yeah. They, the, the couple's or the killed. The couple. Yeah. They're they killed. Die. They die. They drown. They're washed out to sea. So he's, so he thinks. Yeah. But in his little command post where he's got all the, the high tech video surveillance. Equipment. Yeah. He yeah. keeps all of his tapes organized and labeled serial killer shit, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah he's always talking he's about committed. the high fidelity of the picture and all that other stuff. Uh, he's they he's come very back. Patrick Bateman. Yeah, he is. He really is. <laughs> <laughs> very organized. Yeah. Yeah. But they do come back. The uh, soggy uh, specters. Mm-hmm. And uh, soggy specters. I was trying for <laughs> nice. that, right? Because that's mm-hmm. something like, the crypt good. keeper would say. Yeah, yeah boils and ghouls and all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so they do come back and they get a, <laughs> they take him out to, and they bury him in the in the sand. He's like, I can hold my breath for a long time. That was spectacular. That was great. <laughs> His crazy laugh, and I can hold my breath for a very long time. I like to think that crab comes back and like grabs his eyes and stuff. <laughs> well, then I, I love the freeze frame because then he sees the water like about to splash to his face, and then he gets like a look of panic, and yeah. that's where it freezes. And then like, it does that's the kind genius. of genius. What do you call that uh, when the music does the bump, 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 bump? You know, there's yeah. that. Uh, and there's a, a term for that I can't think of, but it's uh you know the basically and then it becomes like a, it's a comedy beat yeah there at the end. Uh, we move on to the next story. Next story is the crate. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and this is I think the centerpiece story only because I think it is the longest. It, it feels feels like the it. longest. <laughs> yeah. Because it has like it works its way up. It's got a bunch of characters and uh, it actually has like almost a plot. It yeah. It just it takes a long time to get there. I feel like I could tell exactly where it was going. You even, Holly, you called it within like the first five minutes. I did. Yeah. And it just, when you, it's so obvious where it's going, it's frustrating that yeah, it takes that like long. Yeah, because it's like you don't have to build up this much because mm-hmm. we know where you're going. But mm-hmm. are you, do you want to see it happen? Though? I want to see it happen. I just want to get there quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So this is about Hal Hallbrook, right? Mm-hmm. Is uh, married to Adrian Barbeau. Yeah. And uh, she's just a complete, like, one of the, the movie's biggest bitches. Oh, like, she's the time. worst. She is the worst. <laughs> she never dials it back or stops. It is constant. Oh, she she's is, over the top. She I is, mean, like. Um, she's more evil than Leslie Nielsen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> just call me Billy. Everyone does is her uh, catch yeah. phrase. <laughs> he wants her dead, obviously. We all we, do, Colin. <laughs> we feel empathy for this guy for wanting him to kill his wife. He's just a sad sack. Like, he's he a really janitor. Is. He's got a bitch wife like it's yeah he's, he's not a janitor no he? he's no, like he's a, a professor. professor oh okay yeah he's a professor uh, i was thinking about the opening scene with the janitor oh, oh right. yeah, yeah. So that's why i was like yeah well he's also friends with this other guy dex stanley right fritz weaver also who a uh, yeah. is a professor who uh he and the janitor find a crate uh, an Arctic expedition from I, the 1830s. See, I think that's another Lovecraft. Uh, I think it I, is. I think like it. The, I think it um, is. It's a nod to uh, what one did they went to the Arctic? Sorry, it was the the at the mountains of madness. But it's another Lovecraft nod. I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, and inside the thing is, it turns out, much to the uh, the janitor's chagrin, mm-hmm. uh, uh, some kind of big furry monster with a bunch of teeth on it. Yeah, I think. Uh, Seems like they're going for like the abominable snowman kind of angle. Yeah. 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 It's still alive after what they say, 147 years yeah. or something mm-hmm. like that. It eats the janitor and then it eats a research uh, grad. And then this then gives uh, when when uh, the uh, Fritz Weaver goes back, talks to Hal Holbrook. It's, you know, Hal Holbrook sitting there going like, 
Maybe I can use this to kill my wife. I mean, yeah. it's just the weirdest idea <laughs> for a story. <laughs> How am I going to get away, rid of my wife? Well, this thing eats people and it just, just devours Makes the sense to me. Body. <laughs> and it apparently just exists in this crate and never needs to leave. That's what doesn't work for me about this story. Yeah, it's like, as long as, don't, go, as long as you don't, survive? as long as you don't go near the crate, you're fine. Like, there's no yeah. real threat as long as you're not next right. to it, the crate. It wants to be in its yeah. crate. At one point, it, it actually takes the crate. We don't see it, but it moves the crate back to underneath it's kinda, yeah. the stairs. Because it reminded me, like, if you if you, if you crate your dog, mm-hmm. eventually the dog loves its crate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it wants to be there. I was like, yep, that's, that's how my dog is. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just wants to go back to sleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, probably, maybe it's a cold weather thing and it wants to be up. Whatever. So Fluffy is what Tom Savini apparently named the crate monster. I don't know if it actually had a name in the story. Uh, Does end up. uh, This is probably the goriest episode also. Probably. What would you think of it? I mean, did it deliver? Yeah, but but it just took too long to get there. It was fun, but it just took way too long. I heard you reacting to it when you were. uh, I did. I audibly reacted. Yeah. Took a chunk out of a guy's uh, neck. That was pretty Mm -hmm, cool. mm Mm-hmm. Like is it foam rubber or something? I don't know what it was ripping, but it was it, looked good. Yeah, yeah. And he rips his face because Tom Savini, when he does those scenes, there's always like the one thing that happens. Where you're like Jesus, and then there's the, there, the, yeah. the second hit. There's right. a lot of face stuff in in this anthology. Several of these have face things happen, which is effective. Always mm-hmm. works for me. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah, hits you right in the kind of the squeamish center of yeah. your brain or whatever. Because yeah. in the in the the Leslie Nielsen one, when they're like the the soppy zombies, he shoots. He tries to shoot them both, and he shoots them in the head, and it like like gushes out like green slime kind of stuff. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. very effective. It washes over their face. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. It is. Uh, I mean, none of it looks terribly realistic. No, nothing looks real, but it's fun. Yeah, because that's I guess the thing with like uh, Fluffy. When mm-hmm. I finally saw Fluffy. You know, I was like, well, Fluffy doesn't really look that terrifying. It's got that, terrifying. like, watery blood. Like, all of these have that watery blood. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I wonder if that's because they're shooting under red lights. I don't know if you should do red blood under red lights. Because then it just looks like water. Yeah, yeah. Right? It takes all the red. The red is what, like, yeah. oh, shit, that's blood. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, uh, the way that this ends up eventually does uh, sacrifice, I guess, it feeds his wife. To the, right. the crate monster, we are cheering the, yeah. the monster Yeah, about on. fucking time. Yeah. <laughs> and then he uh, dumps the thing into a reservoir, and I guess Fritz Lang is going to go, or Fritz Lang, Fritz, Fritz Weaver is yeah. going to go along with this. Yeah, because he's like, are you going to say anything? He's like, well, maybe I called the cops. He's like, no, you didn't. He's like, okay, maybe I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's very, the, neither, neither one of them wants to come right out and be like, I won't say anything if you don't say anything, but they kind of do. because yeah, he's like, yeah. there's no bodies, no sign yeah. of foul play. Nobody's going to believe this anyway, and there's, the, the evidence is all gone. He drugged his friend in order right. to uh, kill, uh, you know, lure his wife back there. Um, yeah, I just, I wonder. But it it seemed to me that the, the you know, he was like, okay, c- eventually, because he was like, you know, what if it ever gets out? His attention turns to, uh, the more important thing here, what happens if that monster escapes? But that performance, right, that this guy does, this is what's missing from horror now, is seeing someone so scared that they, like, go into some kind of babbling like state of... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, when I see that, that makes me, that puts me more on edge, because, like, you know, you don't usually see guys acting like that, or mm-hmm. women, you know, acting. Mm-hmm. It's like, when you do see that, it's like, I don't know. Does that work for you guys, or how do you depends interpret on the, that? It depends on the scenario. Did it work in this case? Um, I don't know. This, like I said, the story. I was kind of like, I get it. We can move on now, yeah. guys. Like, I was already, like I said, we we just knew where it was going. So yeah. I, I felt like I'd already watched it. Yeah, since I knew where it was going, that yeah, I, it wasn't I, as effective. I was kind of pulled out of it, mm-hmm. so it didn't really have that effect on me. Mm. Well, I, I feel it, but you know what? Um, I'll go back to the Leslie Nielsen one. He did the like crazy laugh. You know, when, oh, at the end, yeah, yeah, he did like the crazy laugh and when he yelled. was when he was watching the monitors, and then again when he was in the sand, he was like doing that crazy laugh. Yeah, and that worked on me. Yeah, that yeah, worked yeah, for yeah. me. Yeah. 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 yeah, the human mind's been pushed beyond, like you know that they they're into shock or something. Yeah. Uh, the final story is called "They're Creeping Up on You." Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> and it stars E.G. Marshall basically by himself. I think he's pretty much the only person in this. Uh, well, there's the maintenance guy. The maintenance and there's guy, several yeah. folks who call Voices, in. Voices, yeah. <clears throat> but it's one guy in a room, you know, for very, the most part. Very, how, as you pointed out, is that was it actually based on Howard Hughes or just... Was I think inspired by inspired by I mean, okay the idea that Howard Hughes was a billionaire went crazy and lived you know in a in a crazy was afraid, afraid of every shot in yeah, yeah. 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 Was, kept was his he, piss in jars wasn't he afraid of germs he's afraid oh, of yeah, everything yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is Upson Pratt Upson Pratt Upton Pratt whatever E G Marshall is playing him and he's afraid of bugs he's got mm-hmm. this bug problem mm-hmm. yeah. And, and that's it. That's, that's the story. That's the whole thing. <laughs> but he has some great lines. Like, this guy is so gleefully evil. He it does seem like you're in a supervillain's lair, too, with yeah. the way his, like, <laughs> futuristic minimalist house it's, it's is. Like, it's like a futuristic Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. It does feel, yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> It's all white, you know. It's a, yeah. I think they said originally they were planning to have like a uh, a, a furnished apartment, mm-hmm. but because of the requirements of actually, you know, wrangling two hundred fifty thousand. Honestly, it makes more sense that it's like super hygienic looking. Yeah, based on his character. Yeah, it very makes more sense. sterile. Yeah, there you go. Sterile is a good word. He lives yeah. in a very sterile apartment complex, yeah. mm-hmm. and he's uh, just had this like uh, merger takeover. And uh, the guy uh, killed him. So that's how we know that this guy is an uh, evil bastard because he is happy that his competitor killed himself <laughs> <laughs> and like belittles his wife, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he's like, good. We won't have to kick him off the board. Can't like, fire oh, him then. Can't okay. Him. Yeah. <clears throat> I only, uh, what was it? The uh, people who, uh, whatever. Um, so, but yeah, but his uh, fears, bugs, there's cockroaches running all mm-hmm. over the, you know, crawling out of uh, just one or two at first. Yeah. Crawling out of, you know, the um, computer or wherever the, the, yeah, the yeah. vents. Yeah. <clears throat> well, then worse in his cereal or whatever that shit was yeah. that he put okay. in the blender. So at first I was like, what the fuck is he blending? That's disgusting. But then you see that there's a cereal box and a thing of milk there. So basically he just blended his cereal is what it was. Okay. I don't see the... <laughs> I know. <laughs> Maybe he has... I mean, clearly he's not mentally well, so I right. guess we shouldn't question it. Right. But, you know. Maybe maybe he has soft teeth. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He eats his... It's kind of like a protein shake, only it's more solid. I thought it was oatmeal, but it's not. No, it's, it's like, cereal. Yeah, it's cornflakes and cereal. milk, and you blend yeah. it. Mm-hmm. I have to eat some cereal when I get home. Yeah, right. well, now I you're was gonna literally be just for thinking, do I have cereal at home? I do. I have yeah, some it sounds really day. good right I'm now, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's got cockroaches in it. So no, it doesn't. Keep it, it has, for the I lumps. seal mine good enough. In the movie, he's got cockroaches. <laughs> no, mine in. has fruit and yogurt bits. It's the special. Those aren't raisins. It's delicious. No, there's no raisins in it. Oh, okay. Oh, see, I have like garbage cereal. They're not. They're not raisins. All the cereal I have is like crazy unhealthy stuff, like cinnamon toast crunch and that sounds awesome. Reese's puffs and shit Hell like yeah. that. So. That's the shit you can just pour out in your hand and eat it. Yeah, like, absolutely, it dude. I love some cinnamon toast crunch. Mm-hmm. That yeah. shit's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens to uh, Ups and Upton Pratt? He he's consumed by cockroaches. <laughs> they pop out of his skin. This well, okay? Uh, yes the the end of this the payoff was worth it. Okay, that was on- for your last. Your yeah. last, this is what they're leaving you with, yeah. right? Yeah. That moment was on Bravo's 100 scariest movie moments. I think it was in like the bottom 40 or it's something like 99 like that. or something it, like it's that. It's pretty right? low down there, but yeah. it's on there. But still. So, yeah. It made it to mm-hmm. the top 100. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't understand how exactly it works, but you're, it doesn't matter, right? Like yeah. how did all the cockroaches, they crawl? No, it's not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's the image yeah. of uh, the guy who's afraid of cockroaches cockroaches explode from his body. The, the throat end. one is especially <clears throat> gross. They like make a little slit in his throat and come yeah. through it like a little pocket. I was looking <laughs> at that, Joanna. How did they do that? I don't know. I think they it, talk it's... about that in the Bravo 100 scare. They talk about that specifically. It's like, convincing. Yeah. It yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously it's gross. I don't like dummy, it. but still, it's how they, it, it's just, it's cool. It's... But the number that come out of his body in this movie, it's like they move as like one organism because there's so many of them piled yeah. on top of each other. There's so, it's, it's as gross. if they like emptied his 
body and just filled it with cockroaches. Yeah, yeah. It's stuffed awful. them. Two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. of them, to be exact, all purchased at fifty cents a piece. According, yeah, the they most expensive was, thing in the movie. Uh, <laughs> the budget one. Shut up. <laughs> and they were all gassed after the oh, filming was. Oh my over. god! I mean, yeah. I imagine you can't return them, right? No, like, we're like, done with them. So yeah, here. <laughs> there's big like the Madagascar or whatever the hissing cockroaches Ugh, I yeah. saw were in there, and the, yeah. So if you're a bug, you don't like craw- creepy crawly bug things. Like this is the nightmare scenario. He's mm-hmm. in it because I like the way that it's it's like he doesn't like bugs. And then there's a blackout, and so he's in the dark with all these bugs running all over. That's the place. what I'm saying. Like it's moments like that. It's like it was truly horrific. Mm-hmm. It was effectively horrific. Yeah, yeah. So this is why I don't think like the sequels. That's right. It said sequels plural because there is a creep show three. That Stephen King or George Romero didn't have anything to do with yeah, most people. I haven't seen it. I hear it's well. Dog I'm sure shit. Sean will bring it at some point. Yeah, yeah. direct to video. <laughs> but I don't think this. The second movie uh, had it was like stories by Stephen King, that, but it was written by George Romero. Right, he wrote it, but he didn't direct. The guy who's the, the director of photography on this movie, Michael Gornick, directed Creepshow too. Interesting. Yeah, and it's a That's tortured, crazy unexpected. history. <laughs> and then. They were originally going to do five stories in Creepshow 2, but they didn't have the budget, right? So they slashed the budget, so they ended up doing only three. One of the stories that was discarded was called The Cat from Hell. It ended up in Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, which is another movie that was produced by George Romero, I think, and it has stories by Stephen King. Cool. Uh, I think there was, did Romero write the whole script? I can't remember. So if you haven't seen Tales from the Dark Side, the movie... Mm -hmm. No. Right, you might want to check that one out, but that's another. Okay. It was in the theaters. I saw it there. Uh, and the horror anthology thing, Tales from the Dark Side was a, a TV show that Romero's company uh, produced. Mm. Okay, anthologies all over the place, mm-hmm. all around. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I never got that feeling from the um, those the like the other movies in the Creep Show series, right? They never did seem to capture that quality. Uh, that the the first one, the first set of stories did. Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. it is. <clears throat> Although a lot of people like the raft. You heard about the raft? I think I saw something in our mail about it. Maybe. Yeah, there's because yeah. everybody gets they can't tell which uh which stories were in which movie. Gotcha. So there's the creep show too. Is there's the hitchhiker, the wooden Indian outside of the tobacco shop and it comes to life. And then there's the, the kids on the raft. They can't get back to the shore. Cause there's a big, like it looks like an oil slick, but it eats you. Cool. Yeah. I'll check this out. And there was, a, they were Stephen King stories that were printed somewhere and then, uh, you know, adapted into, uh, the screenplay. Hmm. And now we have creep show, the TV show one season down and another's on the way. Uh, so the brand isn't going anywhere. People still love their creep show. Mm-hmm. Mm. The wraparound story ends up with Tom Atkins and uh, Joe King again. Mm-hmm. Joe King Joe. then. Yeah. Um, how's it? How do we fit? And the the Tom Savini cameo. How do we I dug, wrap up the movie? Yeah, I dug this. Tom Savini and the other garbage men pick up the comic book. They're flipping through it and they're they looking s- at like the advertisements. Yeah, the things you can like send away for yeah. and. They see the voodoo doll and they want that, but someone already sent away for it. And we cut back to Joe King. We cut back to Tom Atkins. Yeah. The oh, yeah, that's right. Having some pains. <laughs> yeah. I, I liked this. This was nice. And then cut to little Joe King up in his room. Stabbing, stabbing the voodoo repeatedly. doll. Yeah. Yeah. I even liked the little touch of when she's when she's folding the laundry and she picks up the shirt and sees there's a hole, yeah. a yeah. big chunk missing from the shirt. And then cut to the voodoo doll, and it's wearing that piece of the shirt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that's a nice touch. I like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, that's, good. that's like a. I wonder. Like that seems like this is a sentiment that you could only have in the eighties, right? That you're going to leave your movie. I mean, it's like a nasty end, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that uh, the kid's going to torture his parent because the parent wouldn't let the kid have his way. Well, also because he out slapped comic him book. in the face. <laughs> but more importantly, he threw out his. I know. Comic he can't book. throw out his comic book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I know it's so fucked up, but it's it, it's justified. You know, it's it, it's the it's the mirroring of the whole like ridiculousness of people being so freaked out about kids liking horror and thinking they're gonna do nasty shit. You know, well, it's, movie- it's pulling that back around, being like, "Come on, this is kind of ridiculous." Doesn't yeah. it? But it feels like like 
this is a movie that knows its audience. This is not yeah. a movie that's aiming for like a wide audience. No. It's talking specifically to kids who are fans of horror. Yes. Yeah. I know, but that's what I'm saying. That's the way you wouldn't get away with now. Now you have to aim for the broadest audience possible. But this was like the reason it has its success yeah. is because it's speaking specifically to like if you've ever been a fan of horror, right? When you were younger, like we see you, we get that's you. Right. And you, it, this is like this is yeah. what your parents were like. You know, yeah. it's like this is how you remember. Yeah, you know, probably not embracing the stuff that speaking you know. to the kid and all of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so creep show. Tell you what, uh, you got anything else that we got to hit on before we go to the mailbag? No, I think so. I think we can save it for mailbag. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to go to mailbag. We're going to answer some of your mail about creep show, and uh, and then we're going to come back and go around the table and tell you our individual thoughts on the movie. But in order to do this, we're going to have to have uh, the assistance of our creepy mailman, Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Does he always have like green weeds growing on him? Oh, yeah. Is that normal? Yeah. Okay. All there, right. He has creams, but they don't go. So he didn't <laughs> yeah. go touch a meteor, get meteor oh, no. shit all over him. No, no. <laughs> meteor shit. He no, he's got bombs and salves. It's just mm-hmm. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just a lifetime yes. of treatment. Huh? He's a creepy guy himself, he Igor. Is. He is. Um, so, uh, we should probably tell you how you can join this interactive portion of our program where you can uh, write to us directly. We'll read your comments on our show. Uh, follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, on Twitter. At Set Freak Show. Uh, by email. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or on Instagram. At Saturday Night Freak Show. That's right, for the time of your life. So, tonight, uh, Jamie Tyler writes in. Jamie Tyler says, Wow, so a chance to get you guys to do movies that haven't been done to death elsewhere, and that's what everyone votes for. Creep show? I bet A Nightmare on Elm Street would have been made if the uh, cut had, or it would have made the cut if it had been part of the list. It's all on you guys, man. Yeah. You made the list and you voted, so. That's the thing. You guys picked, you guys picked. Picked your movies. You voted on them. It was your choice. However, you know, I had never seen this. It is possible that some people just haven't gotten to it, and this could be their first round with it, you know? Honestly, they probably saw we hadn't covered it, and we're like, oh, shit, they haven't yeah, done that? Yeah, they're like, that's the ultimate freak show movie. Why haven't they done it, you know? And and I think people look at what they're... Yeah. You know, they they, they voted for what they know, you know? So I think a lot of people are like, I love that movie. Let's talk about that movie. Mm-hmm. You know, people get excited mm-hmm. about movies that they love. So I don't know. I thought mm-hmm. it was a good pick. I think it's fun. Yeah. Nothing mm-hmm. wrong with it, man. Before we go any further in the mailbag, we wanted to do a freak show shout out to a longtime listener, Ingrid. She's having a pretty invasive surgery coming up in the near future. And we just wanted to wish you well and hope that maybe we can help you through your recovery a little bit. Yeah. So, all best the of best. Luck. Yeah. All the best, Ingrid. Yep. Mm-hmm. We're with you. Good luck. Mm-hmm. Uh, Teresa Ann writes in says, uh, this episode has got me excited. So yeah, got cool. The, yeah, right. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Travis Legler says another Stephen King classic. I just watched this movie for the first time last Halloween. It's an enjoyable time from beginning to end. I'm looking forward to hear what you guys think. Yeah. Definitely. Holly's right with you on that. You guys have a little experience together of right? watching it for the first time. Yeah. Uh, Michael Whitaker writes in and says a second Hal Holbrook movie in only two weeks. If this puts him on the wall, that would be the fastest celebrity to wall land speed record. Or would it be? Probably. Answer, yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think it is yet. We need one more Hal Holbrook movie. Yeah, I don't He wasn't in that Burt Reynolds thing, was he? No, that no, was, was Cliff Arms. I don't think we've seen another Hal Holbrook movie. Isn't it interesting the fog that. And this? Yeah. That's it? I think so. Okay. Isn't it interesting that 50% of the listener picks were mustacheless Tom Atkins right. and Hal Holbrook? What's going on? Because that's yeah. right. We had... Uh, and Adrian of- Barbeau was in half of them, yeah. too. Right. <laughs> okay, so, but we got to explain. What, do we, for, if, you, if, if you're just listening to this episode and you haven't heard the other ones, we did The Fog, mm-hmm. right? 
which had Adrian Barbeau's in this cast, Hal Tom. Hallbrook, which is and, and Tom, Tom Atkins. Atkins. <laughs> Two yeah, row. that's yeah. funny. It's nuts. Yeah, we'll have to. Uh, then we did yeah. a Stephen King movie with John Carpenter's uh, Christine. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully, MF Mad is on top of it, our keeper of the wall. If we've missed a Hal Hallbrook movie, mm-hmm. no, but he says that we have inducted Adrian Barbeau finally oh, in about time into is. the Saturday Night Freak Show Hall of Fame. There it is, and that is for uh, Creep Show. The fog, and apparently she was the voice of the mainframe uncredited in Demolition Man. Oh, huh. that's pretty interesting. Cool. That's right. I like it. Uh, Maya Madsen writes in says, "I don't care what anyone says. Stephen King is great in this movie. It's a cartoony story, and his goofy acting fits the tone. I don't care if he was high on coke the whole time. It works. <laughs> I mean, many of many actors have acted high on coke. It's it's never but stopped him. Before. Seems like he's high. Yeah. On coke oh, he really does. Well, and this was during that time of his life too, right? Like this yeah. is right. This well, is not I- long after the the van accident." Oh, this is before that. Before that? Before. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That didn't happen until like the 90, late 90s, I think. Oh, so he's just on coke for the fun just, of it. Yeah. Just for the fun of it right yeah, now. Not for the you know, he's a rock medication. Star. Recreationally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Andrew Bradford says, as a young kid, I used to have nightmares involving the rotting father corpse chasing me around a never ending labyrinth that scared the hell out of me yeah, that's as fair. a kid. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Screaming, I want my cake. Yeah, right? <laughs> that does right. sound terrifying. <laughs> this movie would have fucked me up had I seen it as a kid. Right? Not going to lie. For it real, though. Well, yeah. I was young. I was like 12 or something. I saw it. I, I just yeah, thought, I, mean, I remember you saw thinking, a lot of shit when yeah, you were Yeah, but I thought kid. it was cool. You know? yeah. Sort of, yeah. Um, Nelson Nachimento. Nachimento says, this movie is in my top 10 all-time horror movies, nostalgia or not. If it still works for me, one of the, if not the... Best anthologies ever made. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Carson Snar says it's a fast, fantastic anthology film and one of the first horror movies I ever bought. Every story is entertaining. None of them feel, feel dull or boring. The bizarre lighting and colors and somewhat awkward comic book style framing add to the charm. Definitely yeah. charming. For sure. Jonathan Holt says uh, he loves the picks this year for the listener pick month. Awesome. Creep Show was one of the first DVDs I ever bought for myself back in the days of cheap cardboard covers, and I watched it on a loop like all the time. <laughs> That's great. I can see this being a movie that you just put on just to yeah. have it, like in the background. I this would be that. a good go to sleep movie yeah. too, for sure. Yeah, Jonathan, I think this was the first one of the first VHS tapes that I ever bought. After it, they, well, it went from like the clamshell, big clamshell. Yeah, sure. Then it went to the cardboard sleeve. That's when I had it. It was on like a loop all the oh, time. Oh, Uncle Cal. Man, those uh, cardboard sleeves didn't hold up nearly as well. No, they didn't. Well, you could like, and the, the tape would just shoot right out the bottom of it. That's Michael, the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Whitaker says, I loves me a good anthology horror movie. I tend to get this and number two confused, but I know that one of these movies was one of the first horror movies I was ever exposed to as a child. Instead of turning Stephen King short stories into feature length movies, I think we need a few more anthology movies like this. Sometimes horror is good in small bites. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. They're determined to make all of his stuff into either a TV show or like a Netflix movie. Mm-hmm. Like all of it. all of it, like not all of it, like needs to be that way. No, it can no, be no. shorts. What was the remember there was the nightmares and dreamscapes uh tv shows on like tnt sort of. which was adaptations of it yeah i mean let's see mm-hmm. we're skeleton crew you just need the skeleton crew tv show one story per okay mm-hmm. uh alexa van zant white says i had thought about making my roller derby name creep show <laughs> be a good one that'd be a good one i like it uh jill calvania says jordy you lunkhead Yep. Uh, Nick Siebel says Creep Show is such a great 80s anthology horror film. Fluffy is one of the best practical effects monsters ever. Good job, Tom Savini. Creep Show 2 is also an underrated gem. Hmm. I think I might have to watch the second one. There you go. I'm curious. After watching this, I'm like, I'd give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Leamy72 says uh, Creep Show is in my top three favorite movies of all time, and the soundtrack is killer. I always like seeing Leslie Nielsen as the bad guy, for one. It's definitely a genius way to kill somebody with a tide. I could go on about this one. I can't wait to hear the episode. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's speaking about the soundtrack, right? Mm-hmm. Sean Roger, who, you know, loyal is, listener. That's sure. right. Often calls in intoxicated, calls in, writes in intoxicated. Mm hmm. But Sean Roger apparently is like Creepshow's number one fan. That's awesome. Right? 
because he writes in and says, I've been researching the library music that was used in creep show since 2011. I started with almost zero leads. It has so far been an almost eight year effort of pretty much blindly listening to thousands upon thousands of library music tracks, which are fucking hard to get access to and contacting people involved with the business from around the globe. I've found almost every track used in the film. It wasn't easy. And I believe we've amassed over 40 tracks. Now we're only left with two more to find a friend is buying up a lot of the old capital library records so he can do proper digital transfers, leaving us with the best sounding tracks we could possibly have. That's Holy right. He shit. is on a mission because even though the score is done by John Harrison, there's a shit ton of library music in it, which is like royalty free stuff. Right. Where you buy the library. You can use whatever the hell you want. We need to have Waxwork or Mondo pay him a fuck ton to like to assemble that Jesus. into a like yeah. record collection, you know. Well, he says that he was on a panel, I believe, with uh, it was Michael Gornick and a couple of the other folks, and they referred to him as like an authority on the Creep Show. Oh, uh, that That's would so make amazing. my that would make my life if that Dude, was me. That's so awesome. Well done, sir. Yeah, That's Just amazing. Called an authority on anything cool like that would be that the dream. <laughs> amazing, Holy amazing, shit. sir. And congratulations. And- I, I love, applaud you, sir. Love my the commitment. God. Yeah, love I hope it. one day we can hear it. There's actually. Actually, uh, there's a blog post. Maybe we'll post this, uh, but it has like the free tracks that you can listen to. And it's like, at you know, one minute and 15, they play 15 seconds from this track. Wow. That's oh at this point maximum in, effort. In show. That's oh, yeah. insane. So last week we watched a movie called Sleep Show. Uh, Sleep Show. <laughs> Sleep Show. Sleep Show. <laughs> Sleep show. <laughs> That's Sleep Holly's camp. favorite movie right now. <laughs> so I'm tired. <laughs> That's what it's called when you go in for a sleep study and the doctors <laughs> watch you. It's a sleep, sleep show. show. Welcome to the Sleep Do Show. That's what the doctors call it to each other. They're like, I got a fucking sleep show tonight, man. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> well, Rusty Ryan writes in. Uh, Rusty Ryan owns the Rusty the Museum, right? And uh, Femme uh, Fatales, right? No, oh, it, it's yeah. Like ferocious Our- Femme. Mm-hmm. Who's um, given us some amazing merchandise? Yeah, in the check paintings. him out. Yeah, Rusty says uh, while basically a mediocre slasher, Sleepaway Camp does have an awesome, memorable ending. The ending does play a part in what I in uh, in its success, but I think the driving force rests on the shoulders of Felissa Rose. I had the pleasure of meeting her numerous times at various conventions and screenings, and she's always the same, welcoming, personable, enthusiastic, and extremely talkative. We even got her to pose with a strap-on penis for photos. <laughs> yeah, she'll do whatever. She's awesome. That's. She, Have you met her? Yeah. Okay. I've, she's at, been at every horror convention I've been at. She's hits mm-hmm. all of them. <laughs> I and really hope she has a good sense of humor. She does. Cause that could be really humiliating. She, when you take a picture with her, she makes like the face okay, from the, yeah. the movie. And she's yeah. got, yeah, she's got a great sense of humor awesome. about it. So. Yeah. She's, she, she knows what she's got. Good, she's, good, good. Yeah. She's got to hang on no, to it. No yeah. illusions. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tina Fruholes writes in and says, eat shit and live is probably the best <laughs> comeback that's ever been said. It's so deep. That kid's delivery is so good, it's too. It's perfect. Hey, you know what? Eat shit and live. Yeah. Because <laughs> the other dude is so, like, aggressive about it. He's like, you know what? Fuck off. Like, yeah. he's just yeah. so nonchalant. I mm-hmm. love it. Well, Ryan Larson also, like eat shit and live but he says the cabins were so angry at each other it's actually funny to watch it is Mm -hmm. it's really funny to watch uh ryan handsome jansen says i had a friend of my wife's rave about this film for years and years i watched it and the only thing i enjoyed was that bonkers reveal at the end i mean it's it's a classic it's a classic ending for a reason like it's it's shocking but i I I don't, I don't know. I I always knew the ending, so I don't know what it's like to watch it and not know what the ending is. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know what that viewing I mean, experience is yeah. like. I mean, and it's a fun movie to watch, but I can see how if someone's hyping it up that much over years, yeah. that might it's be a because, bit of a letdown. That can happen with any ending. movie. Yeah. yeah. If exactly. anyone hypes any movie too much, yeah. it's yeah. not going to Because there's up. not really a whole lot. Well, you got to go. You, you heard our episode. Yeah. There's not really a whole lot to the, the movie. Yeah. I mean, we had fun with that. You go into it and you have a good time. It's a it. midnight movie. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's cheesy. It's It's, you know hokey whatever it's fun mm-hmm. but i can see how overhyping it would kind of ruin yeah. it mm-hmm. i can see it, that you're waiting for what's going on and then it's yeah. the end mm-hmm. oh yeah. thanks a lot the end of the movie mm-hmm. is what it, yeah um about the fog which we watched uh, uh, two weeks ago 
Uh, Mike Welch writes in to say Adrian Barbeau wasn't in Alice, which I said. I said she was in Alice TV show. She wasn't. She was in Maud. Oh, oh well, another correct. woman's <laughs> na- singular name is the title. How dare you, Colin? Yeah, but he is correct. She was in Maud. <laughs> Dave Forbes uh, writes in, says, uh, I watched The Fog with the wife, and she thinks this is a zombie film. I say it's a ghost film, though the finale is Night of the Living Dead-esque. What do you guys think? I like the take of it being a zombie film, but I think the lore proves it's a ghost film. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Yeah, I think it's a ghost movie. Solid ghosts. Because the, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, the lore behind it and what inspires them to come yeah. from the fog is all ghosts. Right. Stuff. Yeah. Ghost, ghost fishermen. Mm-hmm. Uh, we posted a photo of, I think it was uh, NECA, the, the toy company, mm-hmm. um, actually sculpted what Captain Blake from the fog looks like if we could have gotten a look at him. Mm-hmm. Right? These glowing red eyes and whatever. Yeah. And Jacob Laws wrote in, we posted it on Facebook, Jacob Laws wrote in and said, it looks like an undead Kurt Russell from The Thing. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Ben Avett one says, so basically the town gets attacked by ghosts of the Bee Gees then? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. A little Barry Gibbish, yeah. 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 <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, thank you for sticking through that. I mean, I know that was a that long was a mailbag. Heavy mailbag. You guys, was, I love it. They wanted to see this movie, yeah. so they've all seen it. You know, yep. so uh, thank you for writing in again. It's fantastic. Uh, we love a good mailbag, dude. Yes. We love it. Igor's back is breaking over how heavy the bag is. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> want him to work his ass off. God damn it. He's got to earn his keep, it. man. Yeah. Absolutely. So now we're going to go around the table. We're going to let you know uh, what Colin. We oh, shit. What did you think of our number one listener pick? Creep show. Creep show. Uh, you guys, uh, I mean, you have good taste. You picked a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I hadn't actually watched the film in a while. I know that there was like a Shout Factory Blu-ray. You know, that thing costs too goddamn much money. That's a problem with it. It's like, yeah, I got the Warner Brothers uh, Blu-ray, so I have no extra features. I'm very upset about that. But um, the... Uh, I hadn't seen it in a while, but watching it now, it is kind of interesting. I, you know, as you, as you get older and you have some time between screenings, you do change and you, you look at the movie slightly different each time. And so that's, what's I think uh, awesome about great movies, great movies kind of go with you. Like there is something to see as you know, from different perspectives in your life. Uh, the bad movies, you know, kind of like you get to that point where you're like, this is really cool. And then as you get older, like, oh, shit, I'm embarrassed about that. This one still holds up, I think. Uh, creatively, there's a lot of decisions that were made here. Like we're saying, it's like it doesn't feel like a George Romero movie. Um, it has this kind of and maybe it is the best horror anthology film ever made. I mean, we've, I've we've watched a few anthologies on the freak show, but this one pops in a way yeah. and i wonder if it is because of the the style and the design and you know the that whole comic book transition thing it's not just you know uh hey there's a story at the beginning and at the end or somebody i'm telling you stories and we just kind of fade to it it's like it it seems a lot more present in my mind you know maybe because of how um i'm gonna say the word vibrant Right. Sure. Maybe because of the colors or whatever. Yeah. It's a vibrant movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I really I mean, in some ways, it's a distillation. I really like the Tales from the Crypt series when that finally did come around in the 90s. Right. Is that late? No, that was late 80s and into the 90s. That sounds right. Yeah. I mean, I really like that, but, uh, you know, there's something about having too much of a good thing almost. That went you know, on for a very long time. It's like it six years time. or something yeah, like yeah. that. You want to distill that down into two hours. I get this movie called Creep Show for you. It, um, I mean, I love it. I, uh, uh, it's a fantastic uh, uh, film. It's a, it, it's a horror experience that is exactly what the tagline says, and it's the most fun you'll ever have being scared. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, you know, scary, but you know, it's a, it's a horror thing. And like I said, this kind of ghoulish, the sensibility uh, that's employed here, I think is maybe where I always kind of see is like, this is, uh, this is what horror is. And I like when horror spins off of this and, you know, I get more serious horror or elevated horror or trashier horror, or gorier horror. But this, I think somewhere in here 
is where to me it's like this is where Frankenstein and Dracula and all those guys are, you know, kind of live at. So uh yeah, I would say you gotta see Creep Show. It's a classic I think we can say it's a legitimate classic of the genre and a touchstone movie. Uh you should check and the fact they're still making TV shows out of it now, you know, kind of I think uh, proves that. So you gotta see Creep Show. Holly, what'd you think? Um yeah, thank you guys for for picking this for our number one uh, listener's choice. I think it was an excellent choice. Um, thank you for making me finally watch it. It's just one of those things that I always expected to get to. I just had, hadn't had ever actually gotten to it. Um, but it was spectacular. It was so much fun. It was it, it was childlike in a way, in, in like the best way. Um, but it, it was it was well. It, the stories were well told and I love an anthology because it, it can speak to you in different ways and it can speak to you depending on what you're what's going on in your life. Like Colin said, you know, it, it can it can speak to you in different ways, like as you grow older. And and I love I love an anthology because, you know, a movie, if it's a really bad movie, like 10 minutes into it, you might be like, oh, fuck it. I don't even want to know like what this where this is going. I have no interest in this with an anthology. You might still stick with it because you're like, oh, I didn't really like this one, but I kind of see what's going to happen in the next one. You know, you can I, I love that it's it's multiple stories. It, it can change tone. Like I said, it changed tone really quickly in the middle there. It went from silly humor to very serious very quickly. Um, so it gives you a little bit of everything. You've got the gore. I mean, it's it's just it's a fun movie. It's it, it gives me everything I want. Um yeah, it was just a good time. I obviously I've heard about how great Creep Show is for a while now, um, and I was a little f- afraid that it'd be overhyped, like we talked about. That can definitely happen. I don't think it was overhyped at all. There's a reason this is a cult classic. It's fantastic. Definitely, everyone should watch Creep Show for sure. Michaela, this movie's like a it's like an all you can eat buffet of like horror stuff, right? Like you want your creepy like crawly body horror we've got that over here you want your serial killer torture yeah. drama we've got that you want your graveyard haunted house kind of story you got that so like the, that's the thing with an anthology is you have to be hitting these different kind of check boxes because if you're not what's the just make one movie you know yeah. um and this does that really well i i like i said for me personally there's a steep drop off after um there definitely is something to tide you over and i was feeling it after that like yeah um but I think the first three are really, really strong, and I really love all three of those a lot. And like, there are things I do like about the last two. They just they really feel like they're filling for time at mm-hmm. points and just move way too slow. They could and, have shortened them. Yeah, they really this doesn't have to be two hours. Can't shorten the last one. It's only like ten minutes long. It feels so much longer. It does than feel that. a lot longer if, than that. Yeah. Um, but it, this, there's no law that says movies have to be two hours long. No. You know, like it was actually longer than it was two ten, and the distributor made him cut like ten minutes out of it. Good. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know what? Bring that back in 2020 to movies. You know what? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> you you heard me talk about it in our best and worst of the year episode. My what I think about how long movies are. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's just there's. It has like that kind of like haunted house kind of like aesthetic yes. and quality about it where it's like these kind of like nondescript ghoulish things that um, kind of are timeless. And I think there's a lot of yeah. timeless things about it. This and is the kind of movie that I would expect people to be like, that's the movie I watch every Halloween. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it really has the well, trick or treat, I guess, is a modern version of this. Right? That yeah. is I mean, a really good anthology. Book, yeah. Uh, panel, you know. Do we consider that an anthology considering yeah. like all the stories that are kind of one big story? Well, that's mm-hmm. like the Pulp, fi- Pulp Fiction's an anthology that kind of, I think, started that or it, at least elevated mm-hmm. it to the popular conscious. We'll have characters from one story wander into the other. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like when it all converges together the way it does in Trick or Treat, is it still an anthology at that point? What'd you think of VHS? It was all right. It had good segments and bad segments. Did you see it? Mm mm. Yeah. It's okay. like the punk rock version of the horror anthology. Uh-huh. Yeah. It was all right. Yeah. It, there's three of those. In, yeah. <laughs> see, I've only seen the first one. In, I think the concept is better than the actual end result, unfortunately. But Did you see, what was it? Um, what was it? So many ways to do What was the some ABCs of death? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Like they're all like a minute or something yeah, based are, around a letter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Once again, cool idea. Not the greatest execution. Mm-hmm. Um. I wish I would have seen this as a kid because it would have been like super impressionable on me. And I like, I wish 
I had nostalgic attachment to this because I then I'd just be like such a deeper love, you know. Um, it'd be like your phantasm. Yeah, it w- yeah. like it, w- it totally would. Yeah, I, I really where I am with it. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, it yeah. is just always been a part of you know. So if yeah. you have kids, show them this movie because <laughs> like the, I think kids would just glom onto this like a hundred percent. Fifteen year old or thirteen year old or whatever. I think yeah. you you can go even younger with it. Like, especially like those first, you know, first two stories, I totally think you could go a little mm. younger with it even. Um, I think if I'm going to rank like all five of them, I think my favorite is something to tide you over. Mm-hmm. Like that one just like chilled it's me. It's the strongest yeah. one. Yeah. That's my favorite too. And uh, like I said, that seems like a story that could be like, like a gone girl or like girl with the dragon tattoo level movie. Like I could see that a version of that story being mm-hmm. like some big, like prestige kind of true crime thriller movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my second would be father's day. Me too. And then the lonesome death of Jordy Barrel, uh, mm-hmm. the crate, and then they're creeping up on you. Yeah. That's my like, order too. I think, I think I've just seen that scene of the cockroaches so much in pop culture and mm. in life that it just kind of loses its effect on me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I would have put Jordy Verrill at the bottom. I don't know. Really? How yeah, it'd be something to tide you over. Probably then. I don't know. Him shooting his moss head off it was pretty entertaining for yeah, me. Yeah, but I think because it's good. I don't know. Maybe I am looking at it as like, well, I want the horror thing. And that's like the least horror-y one. And it doesn't have that kind of. It's you know, just him. It's just him. Yeah. So, like, did he deserve it kind of thing? It's I also a- would have liked it a lot better if it had been someone besides Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the story of someone who went somewhere they shouldn't have gone and, you know, you know, whatever. And then they mm-hmm. got bit and basically they had to deal with this, right? Yeah. It's because they shouldn't have gone there. That's the mm-hmm. warning story, right? Yeah. I feel like maybe if it had if it had gone a serious route like the Tide one, Mm -hmm. and it had been like a very good dramatic actor who was truly horrified this was happening to him, it might be more effective Mm. rather than make it funny. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Definitely got to watch it. It's awesome. Uh, It holds up really well. Everything still looks really good. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm kind of like now I'm kind of want to like check out the TV show a little bit. Mm-hmm. Kind of like intrigued because I kind of just want more. They try to so, do some of those comic or you know whatever yeah. the, with the light changing behind uh-huh. people, but I, it it's probably all weird. digital. It's all, it's all post video. production. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not actually happening. It's right, all post yeah. and editing. Yeah, um, but yeah, gotta check it out. Freak show, definitely recommend. Freak show approved. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's yeah. right. You can't go wrong with Creep Show. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for suggesting all these movies. Thanks for selecting this one for us. It's been a great listener's choice month. That's right. Well done, everyone. So now we're getting back to the basics. We're going to go around uh, the old table again, and and you guys are going to pick movies for oh, What are we watching next week? <laughs> all right. So we are in the thick of award season right now, oh, right? Oh, boy. So we're going to take a look at one of the more baffling movies of last year. Oh. Oh, wow. Okay. We're going to watch The Fanatic. Oh, no. Oh, no. Awesome. Have you seen it? I have not. Okay. The Fred Durst directed and written movie starring John Travolta and Devin Sawa. Oh, right. Which is on Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's on Shudder, too. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. (laughs) So check it out. If you have Shudder, watch along with it. You know what? Honestly, if you don't want to watch it, I don't blame you. So, you know, know, maybe you just want to hear us tear our brains out over it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. When uh, this uh, might ruin this our is, friendship, he might be the new Rob Zombie for hey, the guy okay. who was a musician who became a director. Like he actually Glenn he's Danzig. directed other movies. He directed Fred a Durst? really yes, he directed a really good movie called The Education of Charlie Banks that had Jesse Eisenberg and Jason Ritter in it, and it was really good. Holy shit! So it's not his first time directing. Okay, I well. don't I don't know if he's written previous movies, but we'll, well find I out. I can't wait. Now, I mean, John Travolta in a Fred Durst movie. With Devin Sawa. Devin Sawa. <laughs> That's right. Devin Sawa. You know my love of Devin Idle Sawa. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the final destination. Okay. So that's uh, next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show, The Fanatic. And until then, ladies and germs, boils and ghouls, the basement is going dark.